Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Frequently, I like to begin with the story, something from today, something from our world. I don't know, I think sometimes it helps us maybe to enter into the, the old world, uh, whatever world the, the story from Scripture we're looking at from week to week is, is a part of. But i got to tell you, when I was looking at this particular story from Exodus this morning, and I was looking through about two chapters worth of material, and searching for that angle, that message to bring this morning. There was a line in this story, and as I read it, it just struck me. I need no story to help us enter into this world, because this is our world. When I read this line in the, in the story, it was almost like it, it just kind of cut through the thousands of years that separate us from this story and, and landed on my heart. This is our world. This is the world that we live in. The words were these. Moses told these things to the Israelites, but they would not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their cruel slavery. Moses spoke to them. He spoke the word that God had given him to them, but they didn't hear it. They didn't hear it because their spirits were broken. This morning I've entitled my sermon, Breaking Through the Bricks. It's a lesson that is coming from Exodus chapter 5 and also through part of the, the following chapter as well. And I think this story is our story. I think this story resonates with our world today. It begins with Moses. Moses has just come back from that conversation that he had with God. We talked about it last week. You may remember last week that God has just talked to Moses and he's told him what he plans to do. God has heard the cry of Israel in slavery in Egypt and he's about to make things right. God speaks to Moses. He tells him he's about to rescue his people from slavery. And then he says to Moses, Go, I'm sending you. You're the one. I'm sending to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And we talked last week about how for the majority of this conversation that Moses has with God, Moses is just not hearing it. He's not really hearing what God is trying to say to him. He's so focused on I and me, and everything he says is, Lord, who am I? Or, Lord, I can't do it. He's so focused on these things that he doesn't hear that God is saying to him, No, I am with you. I will do this. This is my battle to win. I am. So Moses' fear and his doubt within himself are preventing him in this story from hearing the message that God is trying to share with him. But finally, God gets through to Moses, and that's where we continue on with the story. Moses finally gets it, and he goes. He takes his brother Aaron, and they go to Egypt, and the first order of business is to go to their own people, to the Israelites, and tell them what God has told them to tell them. And so they do that, and surprisingly enough, Israel buys it. They're in. They're in with this plan. They believe Moses and Aaron. They're ready to do this. Then the next part of the plan is when things start to get tricky, because Moses is about to go to Pharaoh and say, oh, by the way, Pharaoh... This is what you need to do. Have you ever watched that TV show called Shark Tank? Uh, it's a show with Mark Cuban and some other millionaire people. And people come and they, they share their invention ideas and their investments with them and they decide whether they want to invest in it. I think if Moses were on Shark Tank, this would be just about the worst business pitch that you could possibly make. I mean, think about the plan here. Moses is to go to Pharaoh himself and say, oh, by the way, there's this God that you don't know, and he has told me that these people who are working for free for you in your kingdom as slaves, you ought to just really let them go. And oh, by the way, you may not recognize me, but I used to live in Egypt, and I used to, to know the Pharaoh before you. We didn't get along so well. Uh, he tried to kill me and I ran away, but now that he's gone, I thought I'd swing back into town and just tell you how to run your kingdom, tell you how to, to do your job. Nothing could possibly go wrong with a plan like that, right? And so Moses goes to, to Pharaoh and, and, and he says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
let my people go so that they may celebrate a, a festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh says what we expect him to say. Who's the Lord that I should heed him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to let Israel go. He's not buying it. And not only is he not buying it, but verse 6, that same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people as well as their supervisors, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as you did before. Let them go gather their own straw, but you'll still require them the same number of bricks as they made previously. Don't let up on the, the standard, for they're lazy. That's why they cry to the Lord and they want to go make sacrifices. So let heavier work be laid on them now. Then they'll labor at this, they'll be working so hard at this, they'll pay no attention to deceptive words. Pharaoh hears this pitch from Moses and he says, no. In fact, as hard as things were before for your people, I'm going to make them that much harder. That'll show you to come into my house and tell me what to do. That'll show everybody just how promising the plan that you're bringing here really is. Moses's, or Pharaoh's plan is to just cut this plan of Moses down from the start and make things worse for Israel. And that's what he does. And it seems like it's working. Verse 10, the taskmasters and the supervisors of the people went out and they said to the people, thus says Pharaoh, I'm not going to give you any more straw. Go get the straw for yourselves, wherever you can find it. But know this, your work is not going to let up one bit. So the people go out and they're searching the land of Egypt, looking for the, the stubble to make the straw, and, and the taskmasters are saying, finish your work the same as you did before. And the supervisors of the Israelites, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over him, were beaten. And they were asked, why didn't you finish the work that was required of you uh, yesterday and today as you did before? And so these people, they go to Pharaoh and they cry out, why did you treat your servants like this? They're feeling the weight of what Pharaoh has done to them. And then they go to Moses and Aaron. They're not happy. They say, the Lord look on you and judge. You have brought us into bad odor with Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. These people who once believed in Moses are turning on him now. These people who once bought into the plan of God, they're abandoning it now. They're saying to Moses, it's not going to work. You're making things worse, Moses. Why did you come here? Who asked you to come here and make things worse? Imagine you're Moses. You don't want to be there. You, you've already told God Himself, this isn't going to work, and, and then things are not working, and now you're right there in the middle of it. I feel for Moses here, don't you? I also admire Moses as well, because at this critical point, when the wheels seem to be falling off of this plan that God set out, God comes and speaks to Moses again in chapter 6, and Moses listens. He listens to God, and, and though he had wavered for a time, he buys in. He stays the course. But when Moses goes back to the Israelites to tell them what God has said to him, it seems the damage has already been done. It's as if there's been a wall built between Moses and God's people. A wall of brick. The command of Pharaoh to build more bricks with less straw now stands between Moses and the people that he's been called to lead. And so when Moses told these things that he'd heard from God, the reassurance of God to the Israelites, they wouldn't listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their cruel slavery. Now I know that that's been a bit of a a long and winding retelling of the story to get back to where we started here again, but this is why we've done this. The thing that strikes me with this story, and the reason that I think that it's like our world, is because Moses here in this story has a message from God to share, and it's a good message. It's a message that you ought to want to hear 
It's a life-giving message, a freeing message. But when he shares this message from God, good as it is, the people are unable to receive it. Why? Because of the bricks. Because of their current situation. Because of their present circumstances. Because of the physical and the emotional turmoil in their lives. The verse says, because of their broken spirit and their cruel slavery, they didn't listen. Because of the bricks. Last week we looked at Moses and why he couldn't receive the the message that God was sharing with him. And it was because of the doubts he had within himself. This week we find another people who can't receive the message that God is giving to them, but for a different reason. The barrier this time is the burden on their backs. The barrier this time is the brokenness of their spirits, of their hearts. That's what keeps them from hearing the hopeful word that Moses brings right to them. And so even though Moses is bringing good news, these people cannot or will not or do not receive it because their real life struggles are getting in the way. And as long as those struggles are there, they cannot hear the word that Moses has brought to them. And I think that that is what happens in the lives of so many people today, and even in our own lives. As Christians, we have a job, and our job is to share the good news that God has given us to share, but it's a difficult job, isn't it? Because sometimes people simply aren't ready yet to receive the good news of God. The bricks in their lives are getting in the way. You see what I mean? So maybe there's a person in our neighborhood, or maybe it's one of us. We're we're not immune to this either, but perhaps there's a person in our neighborhood who's unprepared to hear the message about God the Father because their relationship with their own father has been so hurtful that they just can't even go there. They just can't receive it. That physical relationship becomes a barrier between the good news that God wants them to hear and where they are. Maybe there's a person in our neighborhood, or maybe here in this church even, who's not ready to hear the message that the Lord provides because they look around at the difference between those who have the most and those who have the little, and they say, yeah, right. The Lord provides for some, but not him or her or me. Maybe there's a person who's in our neighborhood or even right here in our church who's not yet ready to hear the message that God forgives because they were in a church as a teenager and they didn't feel like that church forgave. And so why would God be any different than that? What I'm saying is that for the people in our lives and in our neighborhood and even for us sometimes, our present circumstances, what we're feeling and experiencing can be something that inhibits us from hearing the lasting good news of Jesus for our lives. So what should we do as Christians who have this good news that we want to share? Well, we've got to find a way to break through the bricks. We've got to learn how to help people to carve out a space in their lives to hear the voice of God over all of the other voices in our world. In other words, there may be some work for us to do on our part, to meet people where they are physically or emotionally, you name it, before they're ready to hear the this, this spiritual new life, the, the, the good news of the gospel. You know, Jesus was a master of this in his life and his ministry. Last fall, we talked to, for several months about Peter and his life. We talked about how Peter was following the example of Jesus when he healed like Jesus healed. You remember the story in Acts 3? He heals the man who's lame, born lame outside the, the temple. And he heals that person, and that opens the door for him to share the, the spiritual healing that that person needs. He's following the example of Jesus. Jesus healed the body and the heart, the mind and the soul. A favorite example of mine is the story of Jesus in John chapter 8. You probably remember it, some of you. 
Jesus is teaching in a crowd of people. And the leaders of the Jewish people come to Him and they bring this woman with them there. And they throw this woman at Jesus' feet. They say, this woman was caught in adultery. You know what the law of Moses says. We should stone a person like this. What should you do? What are you going to do, Jesus? And you remember how Jesus, after taking a moment and pausing, after drawing with His finger in the sand, says to them, He who is without sin, throw the first stone. And He saves the life of that woman that day. What I always remember about that story is the way that the story ends. I always remember the way that Jesus says to that person there, go and sin no more. He says, live a life that's free from sin like God has told us to do. But it's only after He has shown her love first. It's only after He has rescued her from her time of distress, putting Himself on the line, that, she's, that, he, that he says these words to her. It's only after He has compassionately helped her through the traumatic experience she's having that she's ready to hear those words. Only after He's shown her love first. Only after He's broken through the bricks, you could say, can Jesus' words of spiritual life really be received? I want us to be a church that lives and ministers like that. My dream is for us to be a church that helps people, breaking through the bricks that sometimes separate us and other people from God. Because I think that it's only then, or it's most likely that then will be the time that people are ready to hear the good news when they've already seen it in us and felt it from us. We're approaching the summertime now. In the summer here at College Hill, we frequently have different opportunities for outreach and ministry efforts that we don't have during the year. Some of those efforts are geared toward teaching the Bible. Praise God for that. Others of them are simply about helping our neighbors out in tangible ways. Why do we do that? I think about last year when we had the, the school supply giveaway last August. Nine different schools from Birdville ISD, 2,000 students, 3,000 people go through this place to get their school supplies and, and, and backpacks and eye exams and all of that. You remember what we did. And every one of those students and all of their families saw that day Christians who stopped and helped and wanted to be there. Every student that day, every person who was there saw Christians from the churches in their neighborhood doing something to lend a hand in the name of Jesus. It's more than just backpacks and books. It's breaking through the bricks. It's an effort to carve out a space in the lives of the people we meet to help them to hear the voice of God, to help it to reach them in a way that it maybe didn't before. This summer we're going to do this school supply giveaway again, expecting to be more kids there this year, more families. Maybe as many as 6,000 people are going to be there in August when we do this school supply giveaway. And College Hill is going to be there too, helping out, setting up, playing games, passing out Bibles and information about our church. And the amazing thing is this, I think I told you this in January, but the leaders and organizers of this event are challenging us and asking us to share the gospel at our tables this year. They're asking us to share the good news at a district-wide school event. And I'm hopeful that the good news that we share will be heard by some who are there. Not because we're so great and awesome, but because God is using you. He's using us to break through the bricks in people's lives. He's using you. He's using this church to help share in the burdens of our neighbors so that we might open up a space in our lives and theirs for the voice of God to speak. 
I love what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 6. And we'll end with this this morning. Moses is about ready to go off the deep end. Moses has just really had it up to here with this ridiculous idea that he could convince Pharaoh that the people need to leave Egypt. And when God sees that Moses has reached this point, this is what he says. I've heard the groanings of Israel, whom the Egyptians are holding as as slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. You go and you say to them, I am the Lord. I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the burdens of the Egyptians. God says to Moses, I'm going to meet my people where they are. I'm going to free them. I'm going to rescue them from slavery. I'm going to save them from their physical distress. I'm going to mend their broken hearts. I'm going to take care of them. And then they will see that I am God. Only then, after all of that, will they know it to be true. My challenge for you this morning is to be the kind of people that God can use to lift burdens and mend hearts. My challenge to you this morning is to be the kind of people that God is going to use to help people to break through the bricks in their lives, whatever they may be, so that they can see and hear and know that the Lord is God. I want us to be a people who share the love of Jesus the way that Jesus shared it, in a way that meets people right where they are. And then... As we do that, may we trust in God that He means what He says. May we trust our faithful God who says to us, I am the Lord. You are my people. And I will set you free. Maybe today you're listening, you're realizing your life is kind of like these Israelites here in this story. You got so much stuff going on, piling up in your life, like, the bricks that they were made to build. You've got baggage and burdens in your life that's making it hard for you to hear the message of God for you. If that's you today, then know that we're here to help you in any way that we can. We're here to take care of one another. Maybe today it's time we want everybody here to be free from sin and the struggles in your life so that you can be able to hear the voice of God in your life more clearly, that you'll have a space for that in your life. And of course, as always, we want to offer the opportunity for anyone here today who wants to become a Christian, who wants to devote your life to Christ, we we offer the opportunity to be baptized today, whatever the case may be for you. Let's all learn to be the kind of people that share the good news that God has given us. But not just that, but the kind of people who do whatever we can to help others to have a chance to actually hear that message. Let's live as faithful people this week. Let's express our commitment to God and our love to God now as we stand together and as we sing.